Hello, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Hello, hello. Uh, hello, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I'm Zainab Izhar, and uh, I'll be teaching anthropology, uh, this anthropology course. And uh, before we begin with our course, um, I would like to uh, add a few points here. Uh, firstly, I would like to uh, brief you a bit about the course itself, the anthropology course. So basically, it's a subject of 100 marks, and it's one of the optional subjects. Uh, a lot of the students who still haven't decided their optional subjects, I would like to suggest it to you. Most of them are usually confused between sociology and anthropology. Uh, because they do sound, uh, they do sound like, or they do seem like similar subjects. However, uh, when you look at it, um, anthropology is obviously uh, one of the social sciences, like sociology. But anthropology is far more focused. Uh, today is uh, our introductory session, and uh, I, due to some technical error, I apologize for the late start of the session, um, and uh, also. As uh, all of you who, who must have attended my Indo Park history course with the uh, CSS corner, they must know that uh, I am I am <clears throat> I recently cleared my I recently cleared my CSS exams in 2021, and Alhamdulillah, I've been allocated in Pakistan Customs, and uh, I belong to Fifth Formal. And um, anthropology is one of those courses that I took. So I cleared my CSS in second attempt, and I took this course in both my attempts. Uh, but the thing is, the first time I couldn't score that well. And the reason for it is that it, it is a very interesting uh, subject, yes. And it is also one of those subjects uh, But what mistake that I did the first time around is that I didn't give that much focus to every area. So to score well in anthropology, you must focus on all areas. Because if there application-based questions in exams, there questions in which case study, ho, where you have to apply it uh, in real life, or you have to discuss methodology, so it could be tricky for you. So uh, there are eight major areas in anthropology. And the first area that we are going to discuss today is, obviously, we are going to, discuss, we are going to start with introduction in anthropology. Uh, we'll discuss definition of anthropology, its historical development, and recent trends. Okay, so let's begin with our lecture introduction to anthropology so uh, before we start with uh, anthropology the basic idea of anthropology like any other social science it revolves around the people so anthropology is basically the study of people throughout the world their evolutionary history how they behave how they adapt to different environments, communicate and socialize with one another. As, it, as it's written on the slide, you can see. Uh, I want to know, okay, so my PPTs are visible to everyone, yes. So anthropology is the study of people, yet it is focused on humans and their evolutionary history. That means that their past and present behavior and also how the different humans adapt not through time and obviously in different environments and how humans live in a particular society uh, and how they communicate with one another as well as how they socialize with one another. So anthropology not only uh, is concerned with the biological features that make us human, such as physiology. Physiology, as you all know, is one of the medic, medic, uh, biological sciences which, uh, which uh, focuses on the biology or the parts of the human body, the genetic makeup, that is your genes, the nutritional history, the history of your nutrition, uh, and the, the nutritional history of different humans that lived in different uh, periods of time, and the evolution of humans themselves. And also, it also focuses on the social aspects like languages, culture, politics, family, and religion. So anthropology is the study of humankind. You can say that, you know, it's a study of humankind that focuses on the biology of the humans as well as it focuses on the, uh, as well as it focuses.
okay excuse me i uh, apologies for the break so where was i yes so the anthropology focuses on the biological features that is the things that make us human our physicality as well as the social aspect uh, all those people who are uh, listening right now and all those who will listen to the youtube recording of it uh, you can uh, note down your questions and uh, you can ask me later in the last 5 to 10 minutes of the class this class may uh, take more than 9 like it will be extended from 9:30 of course because we started late uh and also our lectures will be from like not only for one and a half hour we can obviously um extend it to two hours as well aur uske alawa ye jo log mujhe youtube pe is waqt dekh rahe hain wo youtube cases corner ke youtube page pe bhi comments mein uh questions post kar sakte hain main unka jawab udhar bhi dungi and all those people uh, and the slides obviously you can note down from the slides but you shouldn't be doing that because you should focus on the lecture itself as well that would benefit most of you okay so we've talked about the two different aspects of anthropology yes okay okay so we've talked about two different aspects of anthropology the social aspects and the biological aspect it's very easy it's very interesting if you look at it if you uh, you know it's a very interesting subject for everyone uh, sab logon ke liye jo ke uh, jinka social sciences ka background bhi hai ya jinka medical ka background hai jinka kisi bhi kisi bhi field ka aapka background hai anthropology is a very interesting subject if you take an interest in it so whether studying a religious community in london or human evolutionary fossils in the uae anthropologists are concerned with many aspect of the people's life so anthropologists focus on not only big events in a human's life but also the everyday practices as well as the dramatic rituals the ceremonies and the processes which define us as human beings so what makes us human beings anthropologists are concerned with that anthropology is one of those fields which is of high which is highly important in today's life especially because of uh, the because of the fact that there is more need to understand the diversity of the human beings in today's world than ever before we see a lot of intolerance around us so anthropology focuses on the humans and what makes us different from one another as well as what makes us what is uniquely human about all the humans all over the world okay is it clear is it clear to all of you So the different questions that are posed by anthropology. So the different questions that are posed by anthropology that includes how our society is different and how are they same? How has you know their different societies? How are they different and what is the similarity between them? It's you know it's very easy to understand. How is evolution? The human evolution over the years has shaped how we think. How the human beings have changed the way they they thought in the past and how they how they think right now. What is culture? We are going to study culture in detail. It's a huge topic. on its own how many different ways are there to be human so every one is a human there are 6 billion more than 6 to 7 billion humans in in the world right now but we all are different but at the same time there are there are many different ways to be a human and then the fourth question why are humans so diverse so anthropologists are concerned with that that's that as well and how do human groups in their life phase interact with each other So there are different life phases of different human groups that live all across the globe, and how do how do they interact with each other? With like you know, in today's age and world, when everyone is in, is um, you know, everyone is interconnected. So anthropology is not only concerned with how humans were were back in the day, but how humans are. So anthropology is very much a science. in the way that the the methodologies that are introduced by anthropology are very much applicable in today's world it is not only the theories and it is obviously you know a social science because you you there is the history part of it there you know we study the ancient civilizations that existed back in the day and how those societies those ancient civilization and the society how they were and how we have evolved as human beings collectively through time so anthropology poses all of these questions anthropologists explore what makes us uniquely human the goal is to increase our understanding of ourselves and others so that is uh, the point that i raised before as well uh, is that there is there is a 
there's a lot of need for anthropology to be studied in today's world because to understand how humans are uh, all over the world it is very important because it will increase it is it will definitely increase our tolerance towards each other and if we will be able not only we will be able to not only understand ourselves but we, if we'll be able to understand different cultures and how they are and what makes us different what makes us similar so anthropologists are concerned with that so this this, this is a quote by ruth benedict the purpose of anthropology is to make world safe for human differences we know that all the humans all over the world are different but if we understand each other and we understand how humans are different and why they are different and where they are same it would definitely end up making the world far more safe than it is right now uh, anthropology is the most humanistic of sciences and the most scientific of humanities this is a quote by alfred l cooper uh, we are going to <clears throat> discuss about the contributors of uh, anthropology or different anthropologists uh, from the history and from the past in detail Uh, and this is also a separate section in anthropology this is a very interesting quote by the way anthropology is the most humanistic of sciences and most scientific of humanities and this is what i discussed before as well that you know it it does seem like a social science it does seem like a human you know a humanistic subject because it focuses on the spoken history or the written history right or the oral history and the, at the same time it is very scientific in its nature that is we we look at the ap applied anthropology and how different anthropological methods are applied to study different societies and different cultures to uh, you know in a more quantifiable manner so um is there any confusion so far is there any question any confusion so far in the chat you can ask me in the chat okay i hope all is clear okay so now we get to the definition of anthropology so anthropology according to jack david eller the anthropology is made of two greek words one is anthropos which means man and human or man or human okay very good so anthrop it is made of two greek words one is anthropos which means man and human and logos which obviously means the knowledge and the knowledge of and it is also defined uh, in book of anthropology a global perspective the word anthropology is derived from the greek word anthropos so on sponsor words are derived by anthropos which means human beings or human kind and logia which is which can be translated as knowledge of or the study of thus we can say that uh, the definition of anthropology the simplest definition of anthropology is anthropology is the study of human kind or mankind however one of my favorite definitions is the one that is written here that according to merriam webster the science of it is the science of human beings especially the science of the human beings and their ancestors there is an emphasis in this definition on the ancestors their ancestors through time and space when we say time and space that means through different eras in history and what is the relationship between the ancestors and the people that followed them how the societies evolved basically so the study of human beings and their ancestors through time and space and the, in relation to the physical character the physical character of the human beings in the past and the physical characters of the human beings in the present the environmental and the social relations and culture so this is a holistic definition of uh, anthropology aur agar aapse sawal kiya jaye definition of anthropology ka jaise 2021 mein jo hai wo basic question jo sabse pehle aaya tha usme anthropology se related sawal kiya gaya tha hum past papers bhi discuss karenge inshallah in the coming classes to so, usme yehi pucha gaya tha ke what is the uh, you know the definition on the uh, obviously the sub field of anthropology what is that so this is the definition is one of my favorite definitions then there is one of the other definition which is by wikipedia anthropology is the study of various aspects of humans within past and present society so this is also a very this is a abridged version of the same definition that was given by mariam webster then anthropology is a study that that discusses humans in from different aspects not only the physical character but also how their behavior how they in the how they live in a society the social aspects of it 
how they what is their relation with the environment and so on and so forth is it clear hopefully it is clear okay Now there are four sub fields of anthropology. So the first field uh, of anthropology that we're going to discuss is biological anthropology. The second is archaeology. The third is linguistic anthropology, and the fourth is cultural anthropology. So uh, bi biological anthropology is also called a physical anthropology. Biological or physical anthropology basically it is. The area that specializes in the diversity of human bodies in past and present. So it focuses on the human bodies, as the name tells. It's very easy to understand. Uh, the name suggests itself what it will be about. So it will be about the physical nature of the human beings, the the diversity in different human bodies. As we have learned before, that there is more than one way physically to be a human. You know? So not only human behavior is different in different settings, in different cultures, in different environments, but it also We have observed through time and space how humans were in ancient times, how humans are in today's, you know, in today's uh, day and era, physically. How different humans, humans in Russia will be different from humans in Pakistan. They will be different in the U.S. So even our physicality in terms of uh, where where we live, where we've grown up, where we belong to, are different. So anthropology focuses on that diversity as well. Physical anthropologists relate physical traits to natural environment. So basically, it is. We know that physical anthropology is the area that specializes in the diversity of the human bodies in the past and present. We know that it is plain to see that humans differ in their physical appearance. We have different skin colors, we have different hair colors, different body shapes, different facial forms, etc. What can we hope to learn from it? First and foremost, we learn that there is more than one way to be physical human, physically to be human. So this is the area of physical anthropology. All of the various human body shapes and physical features are human. Physical anthropologists can also relate the physical traits to the natural environment. That is, there is there a reason why people in some part of the world, in some climates, for instance, have this or that physical characteristic? That is a question of physical adaptation, and it is entirely possible that a group, if it has lived in a particular environment long enough, could develop that, fit well in that environment. people who live in a particular environment as i mentioned russia people who have been living in russia for centuries their ancestors have been living there their physicality will definitely be living from a person who lived who has grown up in karachi and been living in here for the past two to three generations their physicality will be different why because of physical adaptation towards environment is it clear now finally physical anthropologists can discover things about human migrations intermarriages and such phenomena from the distribution of traits so we can they can physical anthropologists can discover various things from the distribution of traits like blood type gene frequency etc so they are you know uh, if they study human body they can learn about different uh, distribution of the traits that uh, in the past and in the future Now there are further branches that are related to biological or physical anthropology. One is paleoanthropology, other is human osteology and primatology. These are very small, small sub branches, and they are not as important. But we are going to uh, study them briefly. So paleo uh, paleoanthropology uses a variety of scientific techniques to date, classify, and compare fossilized bones to determine. the links between the modern humans and their biological ancestors so basically it is a it is a science that uses this scientific techniques basically to date and classify and compare the fossilized bones you know what fossils are fossils are the bones that are found uh, are discovered later on that belong to the ancient animals or humans and these uh, scientists they date classify and compare these fossilized bones and they they determine the links between the modern humans and their biological ancestors so they they focus on human bones is it clear then we move to human osteology human osteology is a particular area area specialized within the biological anthropology that deals with the study of the human skeleton so human osteology focuses on the human skeleton 
Then we come to primatology. Primatology is the study of the physical and the behavioral characteristics of the category of the species called primates. We know that primates are one of the, um, you know, one of the one of the category of the species. So this study focuses on that. Now we go to the next subfield that is archaeology. So archaeology is basically the study of the diversity of the human behavior in the past. Archaeology deals with the history of the human, and it focuses on the human behavior. So archaeologists remain uh, archaeologists uh, from ar the word archaeology uh, is stemmed from the root word archi, that means beginning. Archaeology is the study of the diversity of human behavior in the past. Yes, archaeology may do their work in the company of the physical anthropologists, obviously, because uh, physical anthropologists are analyzing the human bodies that are from past and the future uh, and the present. But they, they focus on the human, uh, the human behavior of the people that existed in the past. And they examine the, but these archaeologists, they examine the actual anatomical remains of the past humans. However, the archaeologists do not focus on the bodies, but they focus on the behaviors of them. So they are observing the remains, the anatomical, actual anatomical remains of the humans that existed in the past, but they do not focus on their bodies. In fact, they focus on their behavior. Okay? They examine the things that are left behind by those humans, and uh, they come to conclusions like when the people, all of those people died, how all of these people lived their lives and how their lives ended, what those societies were like. So <clears throat> I hope whatever I'm telling is clear up till now. So archaeologists used to, to collect different evidence. They used two or three different uh, categories. They categorized uh, the evidence into three different uh, categories. Number one is artifacts, that is the portable objects. Artifacts are the more or less the portable objects that people made and used, like the pottery, clothing, clothing, jewelry, tools, and weapons and the like are considered artifacts. Okay. So if we look at the uh, for example, we can give the example of Indus Valley civilization. Uh, there were artifacts that were found, uh, like you know, uh, the pottery that was found or there was a bull cart that was found. These are all artifacts because these are small, portable objects. And then there are features. So features are the immovable objects. If you still give the example of Indus Valley civilization, there are uh, there is the, uh, the great bath there. That is an immovable object. There's a stupa there. That is an immovable object. So if there are small, uh, you know, small objects, they are portable objects. They are, they are called artifacts. Whereas the immovable objects, such as the buildings, the walls, the monuments, the canals, roads, farms, all of these are, in, are called features. Number three is ecofacts. So ecofacts are, as I've written here, plant and animal. So, uh, ecofacts are those uh, that include uh, the remains of the plant, that is the wood, seeds, pits, pollen, etc and the remains of the animals like bones and shells. Now we come to the third subfield that is the linguistics or linguistic anthropology. So linguistic anthropology focuses on the relationship between the language and the culture. Language is, as we know, that is a significant part of the culture. And not only is this a part, but there is a uh, an, linguistic anthropologist focus there on the language itself and the part that it plays. Okay, teachers include infrastructure, it is man-made only. Okay, so no, features uh, don't necessarily have to be, well, yes, features will obviously, so features are man-made, yes, and eco-facts are not man-made. Coming back to the, going back to the last slide, the question was, are uh, which is man-made and which is not man-made, eco-facts, were not uh, were natural features like plants and animals, uh, were, and the features are okay. The features are the immovable objects that are created by the human being. I hope that's clear now. So okay, now we have moved towards linguistic anthropology, and we've just discussed that linguistic anthropology focuses on relationship between language and culture. 
linguistic anthropologists seek to discover similarities and the differences among the different languages so it is a study of language and it is a lot of you know long history uh, and it is intertwined with the discipline of philosophy so we know that like philosophy language uh, is uh, the linguistic is similar to that as well and uh, it focuses on the relationship between language and culture and how language has been used within a particular society in the past and how the human brain acquires and use of language so not only basically it's about again there is history to it there is the oral history involved in it and there is science involved in it as well that is how the human brain works and how human brain acquires the uh, language linguistic anthropologists seek to discover the ways in which languages are different from one another and what are the what are the similarities between the different languages okay so linguistic anthropology uh, is also divided into three types number one is structural linguistics the so structural linguistics explore how the language works itself that is it focuses on grammatical patterns and linguistic elements different uh, basically they focus on that and they compare different grammatical patterns and other linguistic elements to learn how contemporary languages mirror each other and how they differ from one another so they focus on the structure of a particular language how it is designed what is its grammar and what are the basic elements of that language uh, and then they compare two to three different languages or multiple different languages and then they uh, come to a conclusion of how these particular languages are different from one another and how they are similar to one another okay then we focus on the linguist uh, historical linguistics which is the history of the different languages how the languages were in the past how they evolved through time and what was the impact of uh, you know what was the impact of on it on you know different society then the social social linguistics which is the how, what is the impact of the languages themselves on the social behavior it also has further branches like garbology and localization so basically garbology is one of the uh, one of the types of anthropology it is not i'm sorry it's not the part of the linguistic anthropology it is the part of the anthropology itself as one of the sub field uh, it's a mistake here uh, please correct it it is one of the branches one of the sub branches or a very small branch of anthropology itself and it focuses on uh, the study of contemporary trash as the name says so garbology focuses on the study of contemporary trash to examine how humans make consume and discard material objects so it focuses on the material objects how human make those objects how they consume it and how it discard it by observing what by observing trash okay so it it focuses on the human behavior and how we use different material objects globalization so this is a similar term you heard about globalization but this is localization which is which is a combination of two words globalization and local and it suggests the unique local and situ and situated norms and effects of widespread and even global processes so basically it focuses on the global phenomena and what is the impact of those phenomena and those norms and those events on uh, a particular society that is is it clear there is a bit of a technical error here i hope that we can switch on okay, yes. okay now cultural anthropology now we move towards cultural anthropology cultural anthropologists are the most common type of anthropologists that you will find it is very similar to social anthropology and the cultural anthropology is sometimes obviously it is called uh, social anthropology it is a study of the diversity of human behavior in the present so unlike the archaeologists who focus on the behavior who focused on the behavior of the humans in the past this uh, focuses on the behavior of humans in the present and is very similar to social anthropology most anthropologists are cultural anthropologists as i mentioned before then it has clear advantage over other types of anthropologists because they have living people to talk to yes that is if you have living people to talk to you it would 
become it would definitely become easier for you or anyone or the anthropologist to collect data and to do their research so the goal of cultural anthropology is to learn about the thoughts the feelings and actions and the institutions of the people okay and uh, <clears throat> the questions like why why one did what they did how did they make it and what does that mean to that person now there is a sub field by the name of applied anthropology basically applied anthropology is basically the ap the application of all the anthropology it is the use of the anthropological data from the other sub fields to address modern problems and concerns these problems may be environmental technological economic social political and cultural so anthropologists have played an increasing role in the development of the government policies and legislation the planning of development projects and the implementation of the marketing strategy so again applied anthropology is basically the application of the data that we will obviously will discuss in our classes in the future that how to collect the data what are the different methodologies to collect data in anthropology how anthropologists collect data and that data is then applied in different sectors that we name like it is it is then used uh, you know to to solve the problems that are related to environment to technology to economy social and political and cultural problems there are many anthropologists that are working in the development sector uh, in the government and they they have an important pertinent role to play in legislation in the planning of development projects specifically that are designed uh, to solve you know social issues etc we learn that in urban anthropology as well and obviously in uh, you know in 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 marketing strategies it is also implemented now there are other sub branches like we have already discussed applied anthropology now we focus on the urban anthropology is also or the urban anthropology is basically a study of the humans in urban settings as the name says itself it's self explanatory the effects of urbanization on previously non urban societies and the relationships between the cities and their surrounding hinterlands like uh, the concept of labor migration so basically urban anthropology does not only focus on the people who live in cities and the urban areas but also the relationship of the people in urban settings and with those who are who don't live in urban settings or the people who live in the surroundings and the impact of the increasing urbanization in especially in developing countries we know that right then there's medical anthropology uh, it's a study of knowledge systems and practices concerning health and medical treatment cross culturally so in different cultures what what are the practices what is what are different knowledge systems that exist there and uh, concerning health and medical treatment um this could be you know in it is an important area especially when it comes to public health sector uh, so medical anthropologists uh, are working currently there then forensic anthropology uh, is the use of mainly like physical anthropology knowledge and methods to solve crime so basically this is a field that is closely related to criminology and it focuses on the human behavior and how and to you know the data that is collected by the physical anthropologist that is applied in the field or to study different crimes and to solve them. then there's visual anthropology basically it is the study of production presentation and use of the material like the artistic material like painting body art clothing design etc and it can include not only the arts that the other societies make but also the arts that the anthropology employ employs to study them such as the film and the photography so basically it focuses on all the art that is produced in a particular society and uh, the art that the other societies make the the relationship between them and so on and so forth and then we uh, move towards the ethnomusicology and the study of the musical form and the relationship to the culture which directly impacts uh, the humans that live in a particular culture uh, and how the music in a particular culture reflects uh, reflect the mentality of the people how they live their behavior and so on and so forth then we move to ethnobotany ethnobotany is the study of and knowledge of the use of plants in various cultures you know that then development anthropology and development anthropology is the study of uh, uh, as well as the practical contribution to how modern forces affect and change society so how modern forces affect and change societies uh this uh this is where uh what development anthropology deals with 
Is there any confusion so far in the lecture? You can ask me in the chat. I'll, I'll take a, a minute break. I'll take a, a break of a minute and then I'll come back. Okay, so uh, I hope whatever we have discussed, uh, how, whatever we have studied today, so far in the class, you. I hope whatever we have studied so far, it was clear to you. And now we move for, over to the next part of this topic, that is the historical development of anthropology. This bit of a technical issue. Excuse me for any inconvenience. Historical development of anthropology, and I guess I'll be sharing this uh, these slides with you. However, you this video will be recorded and this will be put up on YouTube, so you can uh, watch my lecture there. And obviously, these slides will be there as well. However, I will share these uh, these slides with the management, okay? So you can take it from there. So now the first is the, the historical development of anthropology, proto-anthropology. So it is, very, it is important to understand how and where anthropology started from, because we say it is the study of humankind, but we don't know who were the first anthropologists. So how long have anthropology existed? This is one of a very important questions that have existed. There are different opinions, there are different divided opinions, because the humans or the humankind have been studied since the beginning of the beginning of the time or since the civilization, you know, since the civilization or the concept of a society started. So we don't know exactly who were the first people who we could label as the as the anthropologists in the history or in the ancient history. Were they the scientists? Were they doctors or were they historians? So the answer depends on what you mean by an anthropologist. We go back to the Greeks. So the Greeks were, as we know, was the first were the first of the civilized society where we have the recorded history and how they lived, and they uh, created the precedent for the future civilizations to come. And a lot of the history or the modern of the modern civilization goes back to the Greeks and how they lived in their, uh, you know, how how they lived in different city states. So we, when we look back at it, we see that. The Greeks lived in the city states and they were 
surrounded by the traditional Iron Age farm land where family and kinship formed the main social unit. So the main social units were in form of uh, people lived in the form of families and kinship, close kinship, and they were connected to the outside world through network of maritime trade relationship between urban settlements along the Mediterranean and the Black Sea coast. So the, one of the first historians, uh, his name was Herodotus, and he was born in uh, uh, in, he was born in the Persian Empire in the 5th century BC. And he's also known as the father of history. And uh, it is from his work that he, uh, he was one of the people who recorded the, the first history of the humans. So basically his description of the language, the dress, political and uh, judicial institution, crafts and economics are highly readable even today. And it is his work that tells us how people lived in those times. And not only he observed how they lived day to day, but how their, you know, their important practices, the culture in that society. So from 5th century BC, we move uh, to Ibn Khaledun. So Ibn Khaledun is known for many other things, but he was also a massive historian of the Arabs and the Berbers. Berbers and he is furnished with a long critical introduction on the use of his sources. He developed one of the first non-religious social theories. So we do read about the social theories of the of, of the European anthropologists and sociologists, but Ibn Khaldun was one of the first people who observed Berbers and Arabs, and they were he, he observed uh, the he was one of the first Arabs, basically, who wrote, who gave the non-religious social theory. And his ideas were picked up by the likes of Emily Durkham. Emily Durkham is the one we'll study later on. Then we move forward to Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta was from 1304 to 1369, was in his way just as significant in the history of anthropology. Uh, he was not a major social theorist, Batuta, but obviously he is, is considered to be the most widely traveled person of the pre-industrial world. So because he, he traveled uh, at so many places in the pre-industrial era uh, and his records and how he observed the society in different parts of the world is uh, shows and tells a lot about the, the humans in different cultures in the history. And then we move to the biblical scholars during Middle Ages from 5th to 15th century. And uh, they dominated the European thinking on the questions that are about, which are specific to human origins and the cultural development. Okay. So these are the three people that we've discussed so far, Herodotus, Ibn Khaledun, Ibn Battuta, and obviously the biblical scholars. There were various biblical scholars in medieval times from 5th to 15th century, and they had significant role to play in forming an opinion about, uh, you know, about human origins and cultural development. And obviously, they, they treated these questions as an issue of religious belief, and they promoted the idea that human existence and all of human diversity were the creations of God. So in uh, basically, in anthropology, we uh, look at from the perspective of the human history rather than from a perspective of a particular belief. And we study the beliefs of different people, different individuals in the society uh, as, you know, uh, and we look at it as it was rather than what we believe in. So people in that, uh, in that particular era, uh, they basically promoted these different ideas. And maybe those ideas were part of the religious beliefs, or maybe those particular ideas were, was their understanding of the world and where humans came from, okay? So now we move forward to, I hope I'm clear. Okay, then we go to European con conquest and their impact. So European conquest, the age of discovery was of crucial importance for the later developments in Europe, obviously, and in the world on a lesser scale, but on a lesser scale, it was crucial for the development of anthropology. So because of the age of discovery and the resulting colonial and imperial, uh, imperialism and colonialism, it was a huge impact, not only on the development of the Europe, and it had a huge impact on all the...
it has huge impact on the society in general uh, and in the world in general so from the portuguese king henry uh, the navigator's exploration of the west coast of africa in the early 15th century uh, to uh, via columbus five journeys to america in 1492 to uh, 1506 to magellan's circumnavigation of the globe in 1519 to uh, to 22 uh, 1592 to 22 travels of this period fed the imaginations of the europe with vivid descriptions of the places whose very existence they had been unaware of so people outside the europe were not aware of the how the world was outside it so they reached the wider audiences since the printing press obviously changed a lot of things printing press, printing press in mid 15th century uh, had a huge impact on this particular age uh, and it was invented in the mid 15th century the same century and soon it made books a common and a relatively inexpensive commodity all over the europe before that the books were handwritten but now because of the printing press it was easier for people to learn different languages it was easier for the people especially those who traveled from one corner to the other to write about their adventures and then it was with those adventures or those experiences could be published in the form of books which were far more accessible than they were before the european age of enlightenment of the 17th and 18th century now we move towards that uh centuries marked the rise of the scientific and rational philosophical thought so 17th and 18th century focused more on the scientific uh, in, uh you know scientific and rational philosophical thought the enlightenment thinkers like scottish born david hume john lock of england john uh, uh john yaf russo of france all of those wrote a number of humanistic works on the nature of the human kind they wrote a lot of books which we'll discuss later on in detail so uh, they this they based their work on philosophical reason rather than religious authority so we have discussed it before that in 15th century or the, they were biblical scholars that focused more on the religious belief these these focused whether john locke or joy david hume on your uh, being that rousseau they focused more on the philosophical reason of why humans are the way they are rather than the religious authority and they uh, and they asked important and anthropological questions rousseau for instance wrote on the moral qualities of the primitive societies and about human inequality but most writers of the enlightenment era also lacked first hand experience with the non western cultures so basically even in the 17th and 18th centuries there were a lot of writers who did not have relationship or who do not have any interaction with other cultures uh, other than that of the different western cultures then we move to imperialism and the increased contact with other cultures so then the rise of imperialism in the 18th and the 19th century it lead to a lot of different things with the rise of imperialism political and economic control over the foreign lands obviously it increased and uh, europeans came into the increasing contact with other people around the world and it prompted the new interest in the study of culture so when they interacted with different people all over the world it increased their interest in the different cultures yes and the political and economic control to the region was supposed to be maintained and for that purpose it became far more necessary for them to understand the culture imperialist na- nations of western europe such as belgium the netherlands portugal spain france and england extended their political and economic control to regions obviously they ex- extended those uh, their control in the pacific the americas asia and africa and because they had the increasing dominance or the increased dominance on the uh, global commerce capitalist profit driven economies and industrialization in the late 18th century of the europe which led to vast cultural changes and social upheavals so there was there were vast cultural changes and social upheavals not only in the europe but also all over the globe wherever they were colonizers and colonizers needed to provide justification back by scientific explanation for the global dominance because they they uh, because the rise of imperialism uh But to maintain the strong hold over the globe and to provide a justification because there was a lot more focus on the moral qualities of the society there was a lot more focus on the logical explanation of the human behavior they they had to provide provide justification uh, in scientific manner 
to in a, uh, they they had to provide a scientific explanation for their actions for the global dominance. So, uh, European industries and the wealthy elite classes of the people who owned them looked to exotic foreign lands, obviously, for the sources of labor. We know that they went for sources of labor and goods for manufacturing. In addition, there were poorer Europeans, obviously, who thought who were struggling in their own lands. So, where did they look? They looked, they tried to build new lives abroad. Several European countries took over the administration of the foreign regions and colonies. Obviously, we know that colonies, in, uh, that is what happened during colonialism. Europeans certainly had a flood of new information about the foreign peoples encountered in the colonial frontier. So they had a lot of information. And this flood of information, obviously, the colonizing nation of the Europe also wanted scientific explanation and justifications, obviously. And the first amateur anthropologist that appeared during that time, they appeared out of the curiosity and, of, uh, and the amazement that they, they felt while encountering different people, while they encountered diff people from different societies. So many Western European countries, in, uh, these were, the anthropologists were from the many different uh, Western European countries, and these societies eventually spawned professional anthropology. So, before we begin to this, uh, before we begin the beginnings of modern anthropology, the anthropological societies devoted themselves to scientifically studying the uh, cultures of the colonized and unexplored territories. We know that they did a lot of different research, ethnological and archaeological museums, and were filled with different statues, different artifacts from Africa and Asia, all of, all of those lands that were occupied by the explorers, by the, the missionaries and the colonial administrators. And these artifacts, these uh, you know, these artifacts were used by the, uh, by the colon uh, colonizers to study different cultures. And towards the end of the 19th century, anthropologists uh, uh, obviously took different academic positions in colleges and universities. It became one of those fields, uh, as you all know, that anthropological knowledge is not only limited to the, its theory, but also it's applied everywhere and it's used in development sector and government sectors as well. So now we move to the beginnings of the modern anthropology. Uh, it started with questioning realism. So modern anthropology is, is dates back to 19, 19th century. Uh, modern anthropology came to being along with the development of the sci scientific acceptance of theories of biological and cultural evolution. So one of the first theory was the theory of biological and cultural evolution. In the early 19th century, a number of scientific observations, especially of Ernest bones and other remains, such as stone tools, etc., you know, uh, indicated that the humanity's past had covered a much greater span of time than that is indicated by the Bible. So basically, this is where the religion was started to, uh, was started to be questioned. And in 1836, Danish archaeologist Christian Thompson proposed the key long ages of technology uh, that had preceded the present era in Europe. He called those Stone Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age. We must have heard about these three ages, Stone Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age. These were the three long ages of technology, and the first person to introduce them was Christian Thompson, who was a Danish archaeologist in 1836. And Thompson's concept of technological uh, ages fits well with the concept of the Scottish geolog uh, geologist, Sir Charles Lyle, and it was supported by him. And he proposed that the earth was far much older than that is proposed by the Bible itself. Okay. Now we move towards the evolutionary theory, which is a very famous theory. Uh, and I'm sure most of you uh, have heard of this theory. So the British naturalist Charles Darwin published his book on the origin of species. And in this book, in 1859, he argued that animal and plant species had changed or evolved through time under the influence of a process called natural selection. So the concept that he introduced was of natural selection. And basically this concept, basically this concept is the one where uh, this is the concept that was introduced by him. And uh, he said that the animals and the plants 
species that evolved or changed under the influence of a process was the natural selection. Natural selection, Darwin said, was an act was acted on variations within the species so that some variants survived and reproduced while others perished. So within a particular species, there are certain variants that survive while the certain variants that perish. In this way, new species slowly evolved even as others continue to exist. Darwin's theory was later supported by the studies of genetic inheritance. The, it was uh, supported by the study of genetic inheritance, which was, which was introduced by the Austrian monk, Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel conducted this, uh, uh, this stu these studies in 1850s and 1860s, and uh, this directly conflicted with the established religious doctrine. What was the established religious doctrine that you know of? That all species had been determined at the creation of the world and had not changed since. Obviously, this is one of the most famous uh, theory, evolutionary theory, and obviously uh, the theory of uh, natural selection, as well as the theory of genetic inheritance. So, I hope it is clear up till now. Then we move forward to English social philosopher Herbert Spencer. So Herbert Spencer gave the theory of progressive evolution. What was theory of progressive evolution? Progressive evolution theory was that in the human societies in the middle 1800s, uh, he studied that and he applied on that. He likened that the societies to biological organi organisms. So he compared the societies like the, the theory that was given uh, by the Charles Darwin. It applied on uh, the entire, you know, on all organisms. However, he likened the theory of uh, evolution to that. Uh, he likened the societies to biological uh, organisms. He compared the biological organisms to society in a way that uh, each of which adapted to survive or else perish. So basically what he said was that the societies have to, uh, for societies to survive, they need to evolve, basically. Spencer later coined the phrase survival of the fittest. It was Herbert Spencer who coined the term survival of the fittest. And the theories of social evolution, such as Spencer, seem to offer an explanation for the apparent success of European nations, so called advanced civilization. So basically, these, theory was, uh, these theories were heavily criticized later on because they also provided a justification to many different uh, to, to the colonizers uh, that. These, the, these particular societies were the advanced societies or advanced civilizations who are who have uh, who have evolved to a point where they are colonizing different uh, societies and they they labeled the colonized nations as those that were that are primitive in nature. Now anthropological evolutionary theory. So there are different anthropological uh, evolutionary theories. We move towards during the late 1800s, many anthropologists promoted their own models in social and biological evolution. We're going to study one of them. The first one was given by Lewis Henry Morgan, American anthropologist in 1877. He published in uh, Ancient Society. What did he publish? His theory was that he argued that the European civilization was the pinnacle of human evolution. Like I said before, most of these theories were labeled as racist. They were labeled as... Uh, offensive to the, the larger humanity because they labeled the, the European civilization or the European society as the pinnacle of human evolutionary progress, which, uh, which automatically or which naturally assumed that all the rest of the societies or all the rest of the cultures were primitive in nature as compared to the European uh, society. And it also in one way provided justification to the colonizers uh, and supported their narrative that the, all the other societies would, would, would benefit from the rule of the British or the French or different European nations who ruled elsewhere. Then he attributed the cultural evolution to moral and mental improvement. So basically he argued that the European civilization was the pinnacle of human evolutionary progress and it re representing humanity's highest biological, moral and technological achievements. He said that the human society had evolved to civilization through early conditions of stages, which were called, which he called savagery or barbarism. Morgan believed that these stages occurred over many thousands of years and compared them to geological age. So 
He compared the ages of evolution of hum humans with that of geology. But Morgan attributed culture cultural evolution to moral and ment men mental improvements, as we've mentioned, which he proposed were in turn related to improvements in the way that people produce food and to increase in brain size. So basically, he said that with the cultural evolution was is directly related to the moral and mental improvements. So if the society or a particular culture is evolved, it automatically affects the moral of the human of the entire society as well as the mental improvements of the or that particular society. So he examined the material basis of cultural development and proposed that development of civilization is linked to the right of private ownership of property. He gave the example of how in primitive cultures that he called primitive cultures basically on other societies which are more communal in nature where there is no concept of private ownership of property like that in the capitalistic society or in the West. Uh, they, those societies are far more primitive because people do not have enough resources. They are not evolved enough to own their own property. I hope I'm clear so far. Okay. I hope I have, all of you haven't lost the track of, uh, track of the lecture and you are understanding lecture because I'm using PPT today, uh, unlike the, uh, the other lecture that I gave in, in past history that is also available on YouTube. You can check it out if you haven't checked out yet. Um, so yes, we are halfway through our lecture and inshallah we'll move forward. So which, which were the people that we studied so far? We studied the theory of evolution. We have studied the firstly, we studied about the Herodotus, who was the father of history. Then we studied about uh, Ibn, Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Battuta, and the biblical scholars of 15th century that focused on the religious nature of human and human society. Then we talked about the European early European conquest in the age of discovery in the 15th century and the development of the printing press and obviously European age of enlightenment like that in 17th and 18th century. Uh, and we talked about uh, David Hume, John Locke and Jean Rock Rousseau of France and how they questioned the religious authority and they focused more on the philosophy rather than that on religion. Then we focused on the imperialism and the increased contact in different cultures. Those different cultures were obviously, there was increased global dominance for the different anthropologists in that particular area, uh, in that particular era, focused on the explanations of, of the global dominance and obviously they provide justification to it. And then the beginnings of modern anthropology happened in the 19th century. We talked about in 1836, Danish uh, archaeologist Christian Thompson. He gave three long ages of technology. He was support by, supported by Scottish ge geologist Sir Charles Lyle. That Earth is far more, you know, he challenged and questioned the re religion. Then we come to evolutionary theory. The first one that was given by Charles Darwin in 1859 in, uh, in his influential book on the origin of the species, where he talked about the, the concept of natural selection. And then we move on to studies of genetic inheritance theory, which was given uh, genetic, which was given by Austrian monk Gregor Mendel and uh, 18, in 1850s and 1860s. Then we move towards Herbert Spencer, who coined the word the survival of the fittest. He gave the theory of progressive evolution. And then there were different anthropological evolutionary theories. The first one was given by Lewis Henry Morgan that we've discussed, and he said that the European civilization is the pinnacle of human evolutionary progress. And he, his theory sort of supported Herbert Spencer's theory, basically, who, who focused on the progressive evolution of the societies like that of organic. So I hope there is no confusion so far. And I've also uh, summarized whatever we have studied so far, right? So basically, now we're going to continue with what Lewis Henry Morgan said. So basically, Lewis Henry Morgan focused on on the economy of different society. So we say he focused on the societies that where the people owned private uh, owned property communally. And he termed those societies uh, based, he said that those societies were under savagery and barbarism. Civilization and political states, he said, developed together with private ownership of property. Where there is private ownership of property, there is that society is more progressive. And he said that uh, people, 
right to own property needs to be protected morgan theory coincided with that and influenced those of german political theorists frederick engels and karl marx engels and marx using a model like morgan's predicted that the demise of the state supported capitalism they saw communism a new political and economic system based on the ideals of hum- communality as the next evolutionary stage of human society so basically he focused uh, morgan studied the different uh, differences between the private ownership of property and the property that was owned communally and obviously we'll study in detail about the theory that was given by frederick engels and karl marx in detail and how they introduced the concept of communism in the society then we move to sir edward tyler who who supported who was the founder of british anthropology and he also supported the so edward tyler was the founder of british anthropology and also promoted the th- theories of cultural evolution and uh, basically tyler attempted to describe the development of particular kinds of customs and beliefs and found that are found across many cultures for example he proposed that there was a sequence of stages of evolution of religion like animism which is basically the you know the belief in spirit to polytheism the belief in many gods to monotheism the belief in one god so edward tyler's theory was focused on not only on the evolution of the society when it comes to the the ownership of uh, of the property but he focused on the evolution of the the cultural evolution of different societies and how he said that the more the primitive the society the more pr- pr- primitive form of religious beliefs are so animism is the belief in the sp- in the spirits and it is found in the more primitive societies like we uh, we see in the ancient cultures of uh, america you know in the native american culture there is a concept of animism there used to be concept of animism uh, and then we saw the concept of polytheism that is the belief in many gods in the culture so he believed that the cultural evolution it is the, it is clear cultural evolution that that can be observed in the form of the evolution of the uh, of the religion in a particular society in 1871 tyler also wrote definition of culture that we'll study in detail later on now we'll move forward to cultural evolution colonialism and social darwinism how do they use these theories so there are different theories that are given by uh, these uh, these people and there was there were clear drawbacks of these theories now we'll focus on the drawbacks of these theories so basically the colonial nations of europe used ethnocentric theories they focused on the ethnicities of the europeans obviously uh, and they just they used these theories to justify the expansion of their empires as again i am told i told you it's very easy to understand why these theories were introduced again and they are heavily criticized in the modern era however they were significant in the way that they were uh, basically they formed the the base for the future anthropologists to 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 form uh, to continue with their uh, to continue with their studies in anthropology and to identify the problems that existed with the these different theories that existed in anthropology in that particular era so yes so then we know that the writings that were based on such theories described conquered peoples as backward they were labeled backward they were labeled unfit for survival unless colonists civilized them so these were clear drawbacks so these theories of cultural evolution 19th century took no account of the successes of the small scale society they they in, they introduced this false belief that the small scale societies no matter how successful they are in their own particular society they held them as biologically inferior societies and they misused and abused these now we move forward to boss trans boss who changed the anthropology so the rise of anthropology actually started in 1920s and 1930s and uh, anthropology in its present form was thrived under the influence of german born american anthropologist his name was trans boss he was interested in all areas of anthropological research and he had done highly regarded work in all areas of uh, except archaeology he worked on every area he was professor at columbia university and uh, he uh, from 1889 and 1937 he retired from there and his students include uh, alfred kruber ruth benedict and margaret mead 
who and many of his students obviously they also worked in in the area of anthropology and they went on to establish anthropology as the field that we know it is right now boss argued that the genetic differences among human populations could not explain cultural variation so boss was one of the major critics of this uh, of the past theories that were given by uh, the anthropologists before him he was he criticized that the differences in human beings and genetics they uh, this cannot explain the cultural variation and basically boss argued that the anthropologists to do he wanted anthropologists to do this detailed research in particular cultures and their histories rather than attempt to construct grand evolutionary stages for all human kind in the in the tradition so basically boas focused his theory could be termed as 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 it's mentioned here historically particularism so basically he did not believe in grand evolutionary theories of the human kind but he his theory was that there is need to understand a particular society there is need to focus on a particular area or a region or a particular people from uh, an ethnicity and how it evolves slowly and gradually over time so his study is called is and he believed in different anthropological uh, methods to be used to so uh, and detailed research on that specific region rather than uh, a generic sort of a theory that was given before and uh, obviously it formed the basis of the fundamental anthropological concept of cultural relativism this is something that we will study in detail in later on now these are two uh, very important okay so it's 925 yes uh there are two different concepts that are given number one these are very important concepts and there is a need to understand it very carefully number one is fundamentalism and number two is structuralism so what is functionalism so functionalism uh, many on other anthropologists basically they worked in boss time mostly in europe they based their research on the theories of the 19th century french sociologist whose name was emile durkheim so emile durkheim was interested in religions across cultures but not on the evolution of religion so like in the past we uh, we studied about sir edward tyler who focused on the evolution of cultures from animism to polytheism to monotheism animism kaun sa culture is kaun sa culture kaun sa type of culture hota hai jisme people believe in spirit then there are cultures where people believe in many gods that are polytheism and then there are cultures where people believe, believe in monotheism and sir edward tyler in the past he thought that the the evolution of a particular society is dependent on the evolution of these different religions however emily dorfam who was a student of franz boas and who believed in the historical historical particularism that we have studied before uh, he did not believe in that he proposed that the religious beliefs and rituals function to integrate people in groups and to maintain smooth functioning of the society so he looked at the utilitarianism or the utility of the religion and a particular belief and the ritual toward a particular society rather than he did not study about the evolution nor did he term the societies where people believed in spirits or people believed in uh, in many gods as primitive as compared to the people or those that believe in one god as the most uh, most developed right his ideas were all obviously supported and expanded by uh, bronislaw melinowski and ar ratliff brown who uh, developed british anthropology and their approach was known as structural functionalism or functionalism now we'll go into the detail of what is structural functionalism or functionalism to be specific it shouldn't be confused with with uh, structuralism so we'll just call it functionalism okay So basically, Durkheim uh, focused on the religious beliefs and rituals uh, to integrate people in the groups and to maintain the smooth functioning of the society. And uh, these obviously ideas were expanded by we know that Bronislaw Melinowski and E.R. Brown. Um, their approach to understanding culture was called as structural functionalism or functionalism. So functionalists believe they believe they analyze what is they analyze they analyze cultural institutions. They analyze cultural institutions, and uh, they believe that the cultural institutions kept a society in a working order. 
so the society needs such an institutions like religion or marriage these institutions they keep the society in a working order then it also provides them a rites of passage such as the initiation ceremonies that exist in a particular society then it focused on the unique characteristics of the the rites of passage of a particular society that had to do with how initiation ceremonies worked in the function of that society so basically there are unique characteristics of each rites of passage that exist in a particular society and how that characteristic basically is important for that rite of passage and how that affects the entire society for example the group of children of the same age would be initiated into a into a new role and they take on a new responsibility as they grow into adults so according to functionalist any unique characteristics of the rites of passage of a particular society had to do with how initiation ceremonies worked in the function of that society so how that particular society functioned at large those initiation ceremonies those rites of passage jaise ki humne bataya hai religion hai ya marriage hai how that particular cultural institution how important that is for that society how it impacts them so functionalists base their approach in doing field work they focus on the field work they believed in doing that again it is it was it first introduced by emile durkheim we know that emile durkheim was from the france boas who believed in field work who believed in the uh, anthropological research in a particular area okay so uh, ethnography is portrayed all aspects of life as interdependent parts of a complex model so they collected data in the form of ethnographies we'll study that in detail later on inshallah in okay so i hope my lecture okay that's okay okay i hope it's clear to everyone what is functionalism and uh, the functionalists believed in the field work obviously we know that and they lived for long periods with the people they studied them carefully and they recorded even very small details about that particular culture and social life and the ethnographies that resulted in it again i'm telling you that you study this in detail so don't worry about it if you don't understand it now the ethnographies portrayed all aspects of culture and social life as interdependent parts of a complex model so all of the particular aspects in a particular society are interdependent on one another and societies are very complicated and in nature so to understand them we need to understand that is what functionalists believe uh, these particular parts in uh, and we focus them in detail so functionalist research methods became the blueprint for much anthropological research throughout the 20th century and during the first half of the 20th century many anthropologists conducted functionalist and ethnographic studies so many anthropologists adopted functional function uh, functionalism and this research allowed colonial administrators to predict what would happen to an entire society in response to a particular colonial policy again these policies were also in uh, used by the colonizers for their benefit now we move to structuralism so structuralism was introduced in the 1950s it was introduced later on and the person that introduced it was name was claude uh, levi strauss that person was uh, he was french anthropologist and he developed the theory and analytical method called structuralism so what is structuralism he was influenced uh, by the theories of durkheim and one of the durkheim collaborators French anthropologist Marcel Mauss, Levi Strauss proposed that many common cultural patterns, such as those found in myth, ritual, and language, are rooted in the basic structures of mind. So, rather than we think uh, functionalism, what is it? Functionalism focuses on the functionality of a particular ritual, or functionality of a particular ritual, or a particular. Uh, excuse me. We'll pause the lecture. Uh, I'll take a minute break. I'll charge my device.
So while functionalism focused on the functionality of a particular end of fact in a society uh, and the importance of religion or any other you know uh, any other norm in a society structuralism focuses on the basic on how these myths ritual and languages are basically rooted in the basic structure of a human mind okay for instance there is universal tendency of human mind to sort things into sets of opposing concepts so there is this concept that was introduced by that so he wrote that the universal tendency of the human mind to sort things in the sort of opposing concepts so they they have always been opposing concepts like that day and night black and white male or female the west of believes such basic conceptual patterns became elaborated to culture so their basic concepts they always exist in the human mind and they are elaborated to culture for example many societies divide themselves into contrasting but complementary groups like motifs i have written motifs which is a french word for half many societies divide themselves into contrasting but complementary groups known as motifs each motif traces its descent through one line to a common ancestor uh, in addition to many shared ritual functions motifs create a system for controlling sex and marriage a person from one motif may only marry or have sexual relations with a person from the other motif so basically it's a concept that existed in many societies and this is probably one of the example of the structuralism uh, and how particular myth ritual and language is basically rooted in the basic structure of mind and how it is the universal tendency of the human mind basically uh, to which you know which drives the uh, basically ye wo human tendency wo bhi insaan ka the dimag ki human ten- ek, uh, tendency hoti hai which basically gives us the need for particular uh, which which tells us that there is a need for particular ritual or myth or language okay now we move forward cultural materialism and cultural ecology so the 1960s american anthropologists such as julian stuart uh, roy rapaport and morgan had they gave this uh, they began to study how cultural and social institutions relate to people's technology economy and natural environment so they focused what what they focused on the relationship between the cultures and the social institutions and with the people's technology and their economy and their natural environment a particular jo culture hai jisme log reh rahe hain aur unke andar jo social institutions exist karte hain what is the relation with the the general technology and the economy and the natural environment and uh, they basically all these factors together define the people's patterns of subsistence that is how so what is subsistence subsistence means how they feed how they clothe how they shelter and otherwise provide for themselves so aapka khana peena odna rehna is dependent on the on is dependent on the particular culture and there is a particular relation with that person's social institutions with the technology and economy and the natural environment so economic and ecological approaches to understanding culture and societies are known as cultural materialism cultural materialism kya hai cultural materialism is economic and ecological approach to understand culture and society okay and for instance harris he in he analyzed the religious practice in india of regarding cows as sacred he suggested that the religious practice developed as a cultural response to the value of the cows as work animals for farming and other tasks and as a source of dung which is dried as fuel so basically he focused on the fact that there was this importance of cows in ancient times and there was a huge value of them as work animals that eventually made them sacred right so this is an example of the cultural materialism and how particularly what is the relation of the economic and ecological what are the economic and uh, economic and ecological approach to understand cultural and society uh, and this is the concept of cultural meaning okay okay now we move to symbolic anthropology symbolic anthropology i hope the last one was clear last one uske andar aapko confusion ki koi zarurat nahi hai cultural materialism and cultural uh, anthropology ecology mein confusion ki bilkul zarurat nahi hai it focuses basically on the people's patterns of subsistence logon ka pehenna odna khana peena kis tarah ka hai 
and how it is dependent on लोकी इकोनॉमी एंड नेचुरल एनवायरनमेंट जो है हाउ उन दो चीजों का एक कल्चर पे क्या इम्पैक्ट होता है और लोगों की सब्सिस्टेंस पे उनकी इंडिविजुअल लाइफ पे क्या इम्पैक्ट होता है एंड देन दे गिव दिस कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ कल्चरल मटेरियल ओके ओके देन वी कम टू symbolic anthropology symbolic anthropology is basically american ethnologist clifford beach and british uh, ethnologist victor turner they moved away from e- econo- ecological and economic explanation of people culture so pehle hum kis pe focus kar rahe the we focused on ecology and we focused on the environment and the economy and uh, that impacted that had direct direct impact on people's culture now victor turner he focused he moved away from that in instead they focused on the meanings of particular symbols and rituals so the concepts that uh, he gave resulted in symbolic anthropology so a particular ritual and a particular symbol that exists in a culture and what is its impact on the entire culture so basically ecological and economic explanation of people's culture he moved away from that and he focused he looked for the meanings of particular cultural symbols and rituals within a culture and he gave the concept of symbolic anthropology again and how those rituals and symbols changed the way people in a particular society think how it changes the entire culture for example these different these he attempted to show how the culture of people of bali indonesia could be understood by examining the important balinese ritual of staging and betting on cock fights तो एक छोटे छोटे रिचुअल्स हैं जो एक पर्टिकुलर सोसाइटी में एग्जिस्ट करते हैं एंड दो रिचुअल्स इफ यू अंडरस्टैंड दैट पर्टिकुलर रिचुअल यू वुड अंडरस्टैंड द कल्चर ऑफ दैट पर्टिकुलर सोसाइटी ओके आई होप इट इज क्लियर नाउ वी मूव टू मॉडर्न ट्रेंड्स इन ऑफ एंथ्रोपोलॉजी तो मॉडर्न ट्रेंड्स ऑफ एंथ्रोपोलॉजी इज नथिंग बट ऑब्वियसली इट इज द कंफ्यूजन एंड इट इज द समरी ऑफ ऑल द ट्रेंड्स दैट वी स्टडीड सो फार so we're going to discuss it a bit and then we'll go towards the conclusion of the class it's a, it's a long session but uh, i hope i haven't bored anyone and i hope you are with me so basically in approach the increasing importance and interest in the individuals were reflected in the renewed interest on the part of some of the anthropologists in seeing and recording culture as viewed strictly by the culture bearer so from the native point of view it is important to look and understand the culture the analytic and native points of view became a major effort to clarify through ethnographers distinguish them in their workers clifford beach has suggested that through symbols people define their world and also transform into the model of universe uh, universe victor turner turned his attention towards religion and ritual he analyzed ritual symbols as factors in social action so basically in modern trends may uh, if you look at the approach of people for example you look at clifford he, he who focused on how people define their lives their world on the basis of particular ritual, uh, rituals and symbols on the other hand you have people like the saturner who turned his attention towards religion and ritual okay and he said that the religion he analyzed ritual symbols as factors in social life he believes that symbols must be studied within a particular cultural context and his work is carefully empirical based on field work in that understanding what the symbol means to the members of the society right so uh no there has been we know that the in in earlier on there was a lot of work and there was a lot of focus on functionalism however the structuralism the theories that were given by the structural uh, by flawed we like straw it was new structuralism was focused more on the deep unapparent and in nature structures of a psychobiological nature universal to all human beings and these hidden infrastructures are very subtly manifest in surface behavior that varies greatly from culture to culture so basically functionalism or structuralism ke dono ke aspects bilkul mukhtalif hain functionalism focuses more on the anthropological research Uh, is uh, focuses more on historical particularism and focuses on the society and the the functionality of a particular uh, ritual or of a particular rite passage or a particular action 
or uh, you know in in that society and what is the functionality like what is the importance of religion and why there is a need for a particular ritual in that society on the other hand we know that in structuralism focuses on the innate structures of a human mind it focuses on the psychobiological aspect of that is universal to all so structuralism is more generic in nature whereas functionalism it does focus on all the different societies however it it, uh, it focuses on the fact that how functionality of certain things is different for particular society as compared to one society or and the other say right? so then in uh, a notable theoretical shift in and american anthropology in the 60s was a return to an interest in the cultural causation search or for the irregularities that could be derived with the like the generalizations in human behavior then we know that julian stewart who had been a student of both louis and huber he uh, turned from a paternalistic orientation to the greater generalization it seemed to stewart that if identical operations were causing parallel cultural developments in widely separated area he ought to be able to discover not the initial cause but in the causation in the successive stages by examining and comparing the sequence so basically stewart ki theory ye hi thi that each culture adapts differently in response to unique environmental pressure and the uh, pressure that has been labeled specific evolution and human adaptation to different environments involves culture and stewart views the term cultural ecology and the study of human adjustment we will study about all of these theories in detail if you don't understand it i am just introducing all of these points right now we study about that in detail inshallah when we talk about the contributors of anthropology that is an important section of anthropology itself so basically in conclusion now we come to the conclusion it's been a very long lecture the conclusion is that anthropology is basically an interdisciplinary and a holistic field and it comprises of it focuses not only on the physicality of anthropo uh, uh, on view of humans but also it focuses on the behavior of different humans we talked about the sub fields of different of anthropology um, we talked about the physical anthropology cultural anthropology linguistic anthropology then we talked about the history and the history of anthropology historical development of anthropology uh, we talked about how uh, different people from herodotus to nabusta ibn khaldun biblical philosophers uh then the age of discovery what happened then we talked about the evolutionary theories and the impact of the evolutionary theories and the drawbacks of the evolutionary theories then we talked about the france boas and how he changed uh, the right of anthropology happened in 1920 and 1930s and moving on we talked about his students emily dorcom and how he introduced the concept of functionalism and the fun- uh, which focuses on the functionality of the religion rather than the past theories and then obviously the structuralism and other theories so uh, i hope there hasn't been any confusion and uh, uh, i don't know how many people are live right now but if there is any confusion in the lecture or if you have any questions uh, please uh, share it with me and comment under the youtube video and hopefully inshallah in the coming lectures if there is any feedback that you want to give us there is any con- confusion on my part uh, then please ask me uh, and uh, share it with me and if there is any question that you want to ask you can write it on the comments and inshallah next week we will start with uh, the next topic which is or uh, that of social anthropology so take care allah hafiz